At Sleep Outfitters Outlet, great sleep is a big deal. Save 40 to 60% every day on every Sealy, Stearns & Foster, and Tempur-Pedic. Queens as low as two forty nine. dollars Customer exchanges, closeouts, and floor samples. Inventory changes daily, so come in for your dream deal today. With no credit needed financing, expert advice, and up to 60% off retail, it's never been easier to get the sleep and savings you deserve. Go to sleepoutfittersoutlet.com for financing details and to find a store near you. For the ones who get it done, the most important part is the one you need now. And the best partner is the one who can deliver. That's why millions of maintenance and repair pros trust Granger, Because we have professional-grade supplies for every industry, even hard-to-find products. And we have same-day pickup and next-day delivery on most orders. But most importantly, we have an unwavering commitment to help keep you up and running. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. A choice right now, right now, between fear and love. It's just a run. Out of the dark night of ignorance and into the shining light of truth. Expanding reality. A population of citizens capable of critical thinking. We don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. There's a, a level of reality where everything dissolves into an ocean of energy. We empower our experience by insisting on our authenticity. That's very profound. Very X X Ending and Reality. Howdy Mikowski, sir. This is an absolute honor. I've geeked out on you fanboyed enough here, and so let's get it going and uh, introduce you to my audience. Uh, brother, it is so, so great to meet you in, in this type of person here. Massive fan of your work. We're going to go over so much today. It's unreasonable. Uh, Exit the Cave, uh, book one, is something that it enamored me so much that I went ahead and ran out and got your falling for truth. Absolutely love your writing style, love the information that you put out. Uh, just beyond grateful for your time here in advance, sir. So, before we get to all of that, all the ways, of course, everybody knows to find you down in the show description, guys. All of his books are located down there. His amazing website. Before we get into all of this, Howdy, do you mind introducing yourself for the audience, sir? Sure. What would you like me to do for that? You had an amazing experience in a canyon that set you off on this incredible path. And um, I would like to know why you found yourself in that position and then what came out of the canyon once you emerged yeah you know it's it's um to come like to write something like exit the cave which is a it's an intense book of of information and uh, it's not something someone will do over the course of a few months i mean that that's a lifetime of you kind of need to you almost need to know the person before you can yeah understand where what's in a book like that so yeah if we simplify it for everybody and and just not just as an over really fast overview i was a, i was a pretty in, in a person who kind of enjoyed life i guess you would say well i was still a teenager i was a hockey player and very entertaining but i had a psychopathic father so that, of course, put me in very, very delicate territory with how my life was going and, and what kind of experiences you have from a caregiver when they're, you know, literally a psychopath. And um, uh, that got me to a point where just as I was ending university, he uh, stole all my money from me. So I had, a, I had almost an almost impossibility even to finish my university degree, which I, I eventually did, but it was really, really difficult. Just as I finished university, then my ex-girlfriend got murdered. So I, I, I went through this period. So I'm hitting 23, 24, right when I should be sort of settling into life. And it's like life got, life was pulled out from under me on all, on all levels. Right. And, and the death of Joan was very important because she was living her life the exact perfect way you're told to live your life. She was she was like the epitome of perfection, and here she was dead. And so I had to step back and say, well, I think everything we're being told about how to live and what's going on here must be false. 
And it began a deep inner seeking. I didn't know that. I mean, a lot of it was just a massive denial from pain, but there was a deep inner seeking trying to ask some questions. It took two years of depression and getting to the point where I actually wanted to kill myself. I was ready to actually, yeah, um, commit suicide in 1997. I just couldn't think of a good way to do it that would be that the person cleaning it up wouldn't have a real mess. And I couldn't think of one. And that's when, it, when a television program on Nova Pyramid Building came on. And I, it was like an instantaneous light switch that went on that said, ancient Egypt has a secret and I'm supposed to go find it. A little a little arrogant, perhaps, but it, it the depression was gone instantaneously. And it sent me off on a, on a huge, uh, about 10-year piece of work, which included the uh, time I spent with a uh, monk from Korea, time with three different Native medicine men, and, and was instrumental in providing me tests, not only in what we would now know as self-observation or seeking the seeker, but also on testing reality. So that eight or 10 year period was designed to for me to prove reality's existence, which it failed every time. When I finally got to the point of writing my first Egypt book and thought I kind of knew something in 2005, I was out hiking with a friend in the, the Rocky Mountains of Calgary and fell into the river just in front of Johnson Canyon, which is the largest waterfall, I guess, in in um, in, in uh, Canada anyway. And it was in that in in that moment when I finally realized what had just happened and that I it's like I couldn't get out. I realized I was going to die. And so I wound up having a death experience in the canyon, which was revealing, simplified to see that. I had done all this work to see that reality was fake, but I was still real. And now the time in the canyon brought the realization, oh yeah, I'm just as fake as the rest of reality, but something real was there having an observation of it all. And that began a, a combination of a deeper process and, and a lot of difficulty and confusion I've gone through. You know, I'm 54 years old, but I, I probably look much older because I've. it's been a rough time since then dealing with all of it, and on top of it, the things that would became an exit the cave, which we would classify as soul trap, reincarnation traps, um, archons, demiurge, um, simulated reality. That was also there around this time, 2004, 2005. And it was, but because so many other things were being pieced together like a massive jigsaw puzzle, it took me 10 or 15 years to finally really get to this point now. Um, the good the good news of it is, and I'll finally shut up and let you talk, is um, that it's through all this process, combination of I think I've learned how to present what I want to say much more clearly, much more simply, um, and, and certainly in a way that where I'm saying, you know, I don't know all the answers and I would never say uh, um, someone should believe what I have to say. I'm just presenting my experience, the way I've seen things, the way my research is, has brought to me only so that you can think yourself, only that you can ask questions yourself and not necessarily believe me. I might be wrong, but I might not be. And that's all I'm saying is, you know, this is where I've gotten to after 30 plus years of this. So here's some stuff that might be useful to you too. And so I think combination of all of this time, all of this difficulty has made me simplify what I say. And the fact that we are in now, especially three years of literal uh, clown world insanity, it's open doorways for a lot of people to also begin to finally start questioning what's wrong with this place. So there's, there's, I guess our opening segue to get moving. <sighs> All the ways again, ladies and gentlemen, to find him are going to be located down in the show description. If I may, um, any book you pick up by his is great. Probably even the hockey one that I have not ordered yet, but I will be. I'm just going through them all. But Falling for Truth, Exit the Cave, guys, located down in the show description. As you could see, incredibly valuable information that we're going to talk about here, as I've been touching on in the past few episodes. So l let's begin at the beginning. I, I have... Um, when we talk about it and we, we look back in the history or his story, which you've got a great book exposing the expositions uh, and the world's fairs, and we look at what is presented as us as our actual history, reading in your book as well, Exit the Cave, when you were talking about how they date things with a J or an I in front of it, and therefore the three numbers after it could possibly just have an I rather than a one in front of it. Therefore, that can be an explanation of the thousands of years that have been inserted. We have um, video, photographic evidence rather 
of this amazing man that I saw the other day cleaning up the inside of what they said was um, being torn down, but obviously it was flooded in, and it had an I-803 on the side of it, and it said it was from 1903. And I was like, but hang on, it says I-803, but you gave me the site to see that it was a, the letter I in front of it. Blew my mind. So there's right. there's that part of it. So we've already gotten a historical whitewash as far as everything goes, as far as I'm concerned, especially when we look into something like the simulation, which we're going to absolutely touch on, where you, actually you can't prove anything outside of your observation. Maybe life started whenever you appeared here or whenever you became conscious, right? So just like they say in Dark City, you weren't a kid here. We were brought here, right? So with right. this, as the whole apprehension begins... When we look at this place and people say that this is going to be fixed or going to be changed, this is something I invested a lot of time and energy and everything into until very recently, that this was a place that could be fixed. Then I got to the place of, well, it's probably for your soul and this is a school, so more considerations for the atrocities here. And seeing it like, oh, well, if that's the case, then of course you signed up for this and it's not going to be fixed in the sense that it's too good at what it's doing to teach you how to be better. Now I've come to look at this in a similar way to where you are. And this is, this is outside of the need for this place to be something other than what it is. I've stopped looking at this through the rose-colored glasses that I wished it was and was able to change it into. And as you can see around me here, I've decorated my prison cell quite well. But now I see this place so differently, man. And like you, it's not a firm-held belief. Now it's just simply an alternative, balanced perspective. It's it's something I didn't have before. Mark Passio has this, um, you know, seven-hour YouTube that he just goes off on the idea that him as a Satanist heard other Satanists bragging openly about inserting manifestation and uh, these New Age concepts as a disembalancing tool to keep things disharmonious. And so... To, to sum this all up, as we, as we move into what I'm now seeing the most important damn thing is, which is balance, being very aware that this is a fucked up place and a beautiful place all at the same time, and finding the truth somewhere in between, as you mentioned, um, Rose's work with the pyramids, the A, B to C, then as we're looking at all of this, how the hell did this thing get where it is? I, I'd like for you, if you don't mind, to just kind of go into the Cathars or the Gnostics' perspectives about the Demiurge. And that it's and Sophia, and just give us a quick, if you don't mind, rundown to give us a basis of what we're talking about. Sure, and and I guess <clears throat> to begin with that, that's a pretty standard um, reaction. I had one similar to myself. When you begin to see that the world is insane, the problem is that we were taught from like as soon as we could understand language from everyone around us that. This world was built by a loving God who cares about us, has built this world for uh, our experience and our wonderment and our improvement. Oh, you're going to get thrown in some challenges, but you'll, you'll learn how to go through them so that you'll gain perfection and you'll go back and join this God. Isn't it all wonderful? And that's what we that's how we've been presented things. So as soon as somebody begins to get to the point and says, wait a minute, this place is insane. Like everything about and I don't just mean human systems, I mean, everything from the fact that everything has to eat something else just to survive here, that, that's an insane system. It's absolutely nuts. So the natural response is, well, because we've been told it's supposed to be wonderful and perfect, there must be something wrong with it. There's an error somewhere. I'm seeing there's an error, so I'm going to fix it. And that's a natural thing, right? God made a mistake somehow, and I'm going to help fix it. So it, that's pretty natural. Someone does this for five years, they wind up exhausted, they wind up getting nowhere, and they find that they're right back where they started from. In fact, probably two steps back. Before we go on into the story, though, however, one thing I have learned over the course of the years is all the work I've done on myself, personally, or the um, help or value I've done with uh, people in sort of in my immediate environment, people I've interacted with, people I've talked to, people I've shared with, or people who shared with me, those have all seemed to have actually had uh, value and have actually had something of change. As soon as though you try to move to, I'm going to fix everything, it just winds up into a mess. And yeah, it was only kind of Kind of Mr. Park, the 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 Korean monk I spent time with, he he talked sort of about this with us, but we never really understood it when he was talking to us. We were we were all 20 steps below where he was, you know. Um, but once you begin to see that, hey, wait a minute, actually it's an evil creator 
which the Gnostics called the Demiurge or the Cathars called Rex Mundi, who created a system of basically energy extraction, energy theft, a sim, uh, an AI artificial simulation designed only to basically keep the simulation running. Once you begin to understand, wait a minute, that's actually what we exist in, then everything that then you can kind of take a little piece of because all of these ancient what we know now as a religion in their ancient forms had real useful information in them so like for example when buddha says things like samsara is, is uh, nirvana and you know the uh things are perfect as they are yes they are it doesn't mean they're good or it doesn't mean they're wonderful it means they're perfect perfect from the standpoint of the demiurge in that it's a perfect system of pain and destruction well not just pain and destruction because it's just emotion Pain and emotion, pain and fear are just really good emotions, but the system will take any emotion. It doesn't matter. So the system is actually perfect. So once you see the system is built to be insane, it's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. In fact, it's even getting better. It's perfecting itself. It's perfecting its own perfection now. So the best thing we can do is just let it be. Let the system be and instead figure out, well, what is this thing? Because I then, whatever the true I is, I don't have to be insane. The system can be insane. I can choose sanity. The system can choose to be um, energy stealing and trapping and whatnot. I can choose something different. So even though what I have to say on the surface sounds very negative for people, I think it's actually extremely positive because it does force this giant turn away from out there to right here. And the recognition that no matter how bad out there is in here, I can do something else and I can be something else, which you begin to find is actually truly what you are. It is this. It is the image from the plate that you have about Jacob's ladder in the dream and where <laughs> the the ladder is now 90 degrees and he sees himself as the red king at the C point in Rose's pyramid above, right? But death is mm -hmm. what lies on the floor. This is your old self. This is the program self, this old you, this um, louche trapped entity that was fooled into all this. No, Nobody gets out of this unscathed, guys. So this ladder, though, is this 90 degree perspective. Now you're seeing yourself from a whole and new you should show If you're going to do this, show the first plate, though, yes, at the beginning. Yes. What, he, what he's showing you is plates of something known as the Mutus Liber, uh, the silent book. It's a, an alchemic text that came out in the 1600s. So first show the, the first image. There's 15 images in there, but the, fir the first and the last make the most sense to his point. So here's the first. There you can show the first image. There you go. So, so that's the starting point. Yeah, if you don't mind, do you do you mind? Well, yeah. So uh, what you've got here, I mean, there's so there's a ton of symbolism, but you've got this is supposed to be Jacob, uh, and Jacob's ladder. So Jacob is laying with his head on the on the grail stone. This is the ladder that the claim is he goes up and rises to heaven. What, of course, he really winds up going to see is the true nature of reality and that the everything he's ever known is a lie. And uh, so that that's really what the story is. And then when he goes to the end, it's an entire set of alchemic images all the way through, which is sort of, it's the work that's meant to be done to take you from this Jacob who just finds out he's living in a lie to the eventual point of Jacob realizing his true nature. Which, yes, the body laying on the ground would be, it's not, don't think of it as a physical body. This is another one of the big things that people get, get to uh, done with they think oh well um i can renounce the world i can renounce uh, all of this and i can just live in a happy place or a smart place or a wise place and well no you're in you're in the matrix as long as you're in plato's cave as long as you're in the matrix you're in the in the deception you're in the duality so in this case the body is representing all of physical all of physical, non-physical matter, the etheric realm, the astral realm, it's representing everything. It's all been tossed aside. Therefore, there's no ladder anymore because there's nowhere to go. Literally, what, what the Gnostic would call the divine spark has been, uh, in a sense, re, we'll call it re reassembled, reunified. It's a, it's a very detailed, I'm actually working on that now in book two to fully explain what a divine spark is and and kind of what happens with it and Therefore, even things in like the New Testament and Buddhist texts and all sorts of things begin to make even more and more sense when you begin to define the word divine spark as to what's being referred to. To go back to his earlier question, so in if you look at Gnostic 
uh, text, which is uh, the Nag Hammadi fragments mostly, which is one of the best ancient uh, texts we have for, you can look into ancient Egyptian texts as well, or other ancient texts. They're just, there's a, the, the older you go, the, the more difficult it is, because once you put it in a hieroglyphic language, it's very hard to make the translation due to the layers of information there. Um, so the Nag Hammadi texts give us some opportunity. Simplified is that there's, they, they're presenting that there's an all perfect experience or an all perfect totality they just call it by the name the father but the father includes a female half known as barbello so they have this 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 totality from this totality various what they call aeons were ma manifested from this from this totality and live in a place known as the pleroma which is interesting because we have the church of rome right which sort of has taken over this realm but the original is the pleroma from the pleroma though there, this, the story generally goes that one of the aeons, Sophia, who in many cases they consider to have been Christ's supposed um, true consort in this pleroma, decided to have decided to create without him, and and in the course of the creating without having a proper male and female half, created a what they would classify as a monster, which became the demiurge who, in a sense, decided to then, well, if Sophia can create, I can create too. Uh, but the only way he could create was, in a sense, creating like what we would consider a computer-type simulation. They couldn't create a real world. You could only create a copy or a model of something that was already. So that's, that's another key element when you look at these texts. They always refer to this place in Gnostics, they call it Hal, which is their word for simulation. It's a copy. It's a it's a it's a mirror of something else. It's not real, but it's based on something real, and that's another clue for uh, uh, going through this. But that doesn't necessarily I mean again. It's a, it's all a metaphor and metaphorical language, and again, it doesn't necessarily mean that exactly what it says. Nor does it nor is it trying to attack the feminine or females in any way, which is which is what it also became. It was just a way of trying to explain something unexplainable in, uh, in mythology. Um, so if you, if you don't take it exactly literally and try to go more into what it's pointing to, these myths begin to explain themselves, but you'll find it. I mean, if you go through the ancient Egyptian uh, creation myths, you'll find similar things in there. Just uh, most, most translators can't see that it's, it's providing that so that you really have to dig through the translation and almost re retranslate the hieroglyphs yourself to get it. But if we're honest with ourselves, as the experience I just encountered was, it, again, before I really dove into your work, I was feeling all of the things that you talk about. You actually are an extreme comfort to me in a way that I'm not, um, I guess, um, I'm not oblivious to that it's, it's you've filled a void where one entered and you filled it immediately with what was answering the questions that I was already having when seeing this place, because we look around and again, we make all kinds of considerations in the new age. I was sitting here saying, oh, it's my, I went through all the things that made me better, which is not untrue, but the fact that I signed up for them willingly ahead of time and then obliterated my uh, knowledge of the existence of those encounters occurring in this time, it, it, it began to make less and less and less sense to me. And when, especially when I shunned the, uh, the delusionalness that I was in, that's when it really became very clear. It was like, oh, okay, see it as it is, not as what you wish it to be. And when you really look around this right. place, whether it's a simulation, you can't prove anything's going on outside of your vision or not, you find yourself in your consciousness bombarded by absolute terror around every corner. There's, it's, it's a horrible thing. And then whenever you're sitting there talking to these, um, these women who will openly admit that they feel like they're, they got signed up to be raped and to be, uh, horribly used and abused and that, oh, it's just part of my contract. And so they'll walk into relationships, just knowing that whatever considerations they have for that partner is going to be part of their contract rather than the awareness that maybe it's a trap and to stand the hell up. It's a fascinating perspective that, yes, led me to extreme darkness, or was it the darkness that led me there? But through that path, what I what I really realized on the other side is empowerment. It's this abandonment of this delusional nonsense and this seeing it for what it is and going, okay, got it. It's a, it's a fucking prison, man, and we're just going to do our best uh, to get the hell out of here. So the question then is, is if this is a, I mean, so many questions, Howdy, but if this is a simulation that is a carbon copy of a real hold, reality. Hold on to the question and hold on, just hold on, hold on, to, just hold that question. I'm going to answer what you just, a little bit of what you just said there first. Please. And that was one of the big 
problems that I found early on, whether it was what do we call the new age now, spirituality or religion, is that the general message is whatever, if something is bad in your life, the reason for it is you. You are the reason for the problem. So it's it, it throws automatically guilt and shame upon you and and really sneaky because and if it's religion, they'll say, well, you don't have enough faith. So you, you're not praying hard enough or something or, you know, but it's always something if, if it's spirituality, it's you're not good enough. You're not loving enough. You're not kind enough. No one ever sits back and says, well, if even if I've done something kind of goofy in the world. Who actually set up a reality where something goofy can even happen? Because if a loving creator wanted a world where there was harmony and peace and balance, they could create that. They could create that. And so just right away, when you see that the animal outside has to eat the other animal to survive, has to create pain and suffering and anxiety and everything else just to live another day, to me, that indicates that actually the and it's not that we take no responsibility for what we're doing like you say it's it's like we have to really look into how we live why we live and why we've been the way we are but it's the recognition of actually the main uh the main guilt or the main uh, finger pointing should go to that which created the system not us because they could have created a completely different harmonious system they could have given us all the information all the knowledge required everything that's needed not a not a continuous realm of reincarnation and memory wipes and coming back here in complete ignorance and having to do this all over again and and so that to me is one of the great empowerments where it's like oh yeah the in general the in general the reason for the system is the thing that created it and now my my job is only to totally reduce my interaction in any sort of harmful way with it to just live in a way where I've, it's you, you actually gain a tremendous empathy for everyone and everything i mean i have empathy for the trees for the clouds for the insects because i know everything in one way or another is trapped here and is suffering and is in 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 certain levels of pain anxiety stress mess you know to different degrees but even if someone's out there saying hey my life is great everything's fantastic in my life yeah but there are two billion people right now who are suffering horribly yes. horrific stuff stuff you can't even imagine what they're suffering and that's what they're suffering through so to me it doesn't matter even if my life is perfect if the whole rest of the world is suffering that's not a world i want to be in so it, it allows you to have this empathy and then to say well then the one of the best things i can do is don't just just don't create more suffering just fine just 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 be a useful uh, interactive thing here and then just put my focus here and say okay i don't need to fix myself from the standpoint of being perfect what i need to do is i need to become clear balanced sane and aware and if you do all of that that's how you take your greatest steps and that doesn't come from seeing yourself as defective or that there's something wrong with you it comes to see that you've been deceived and lied to ever since you even before you were born, you've been lied and deceived constantly. So here's an opportunity to rip all that off and start fresh and decide to see things um, with the way that they come to be seen to you. You get an opportunity to build your own system of belief and your own system of idea and your own system of faith, not somebody else's. So you can jump into your question. I just, love what it. you that were saying just led into that. Perfect. And zero apologies necessary. This is definitely a conversation, not an interview. We, uh, whatever I was growing up, same thing, man. This hits you in the gut early on. Why do things have to die for other things to survive? Anything. You're watching the movie Fern Gully and you're watching the trees get X'd on them and you're crying. You're a, like, my mom had to pull me out of, I think, three different movies as a child that were supposed to be fun and amazing for me because I'm screaming, crying at what's occurring. Benji, whenever some dog and the had puppies and the mom died, horrible. Why are you, why are you marketing this to children? And then uh, Land Before Time, of course, when the mom dies, fuck that movie. Then also, um, what was the other one? Uh, Vern Gully, same thing. So we go with these fantastic right. things. Oh, all your kids, you're having fun. And then it's trauma, trauma, trauma. I can't stand that shit, man. I'm not wired for it. And so therefore you look around at other folks that aren't wired for it. And you're saying, what, what is this place? But like you, it's the fundamental modus operandi. It's the way this place functions. That is the issue. And this is right. going to come into play later through your recapitulation, through 
your idea of standing firm in the decisions that you made, even if you've got things that you regret, guys, go back and check them out. If you've done someone wrong, you know this in your heart, fix it, right? This is your responsibility right. if you feel it is. But to the idea that you've been forced to survive in a place that later on you're going to be, it's going to be brought back up to you that you killed a rat to survive. It's like, well, you killed that rat. You, you had two options to kill something to survive, but but you killed that one. And that's why you need to come back here and sign another contract. Oh, silly. Oh, it's not. It's not. It's even worse than that. Like once you go through the near death experiences and you listen to, thankfully, the thousands of them that are out there. And I'd highly recommend for those who are interested in digging into this field, um, Mark over at Forever Conscious Research does a great job at breaking them down. Of course, uh, I mean, really, really great work there. Um, Wayne Bush at his site, trickbythelight.com. He was one of the original ones to speak about this stuff. And his website is just a, a fantastic place of, of information. So I always like to, you know, let others know, places know where there's others, places to go see. But when you dig into these near-death experiences and they go through the life review, uh, you talked about the recapitulation, which is something we have to do here in our world uh, so that we don't get caught when, when it's there. But over there, the, the, you could be a saint. You could be the most perfect, wonderful person, and they will find in this review the one time that somebody dropped an apple on the street next to you and you didn't help to pick it up. And because you didn't pick it up, oh, they picked it up and they hurt their back. And then because they hurt their back, they did this to their kids. So it's all your fault. It'll always, always, always be your fault for the simplest, tiniest thing. So it doesn't matter. They are they are tracking and the, these beings, the, the Gnostics called them archons, which are you might call the children of the demiurge. They are sort of running, they run this reality in a sense for the demiurge. They are keeping track of every single thing everyone does so that they have a gigantic record system to use against us at some point in time in order to make us feel guilt shame and regret those are the three biggest things they they're trying to get from us guilt shame and regret those are the three biggest things they'll use to one way or another say that's why you have to go back and have another life um often you know you haven't learned to love enough you weren't a good enough person you didn't you know you were you were bad to your sister or or um <clears throat> yeah and any of those things so that's why it's really important to go through our whole life now before we do the crossover point and we know our life so intimately through the recapitulation that there's absolutely nothing in our experience that can surprise us we've gone through and seen all the all the errors we've done the mistakes we made and like you say one way or another atone for them either externally with the people that you did feel that you had a problem with or internally at least to yourself to come to an understanding of this is who i was at the moment this is why it happened i'm not like that now there's been a massive change and it's also to see all the times we've been very very positive to ourselves and others and be kind to ourselves and others and animals and and get this complete totality of our life because as you're seeing i don't know if you got to that point in falling for truth yet where i go through my own deep uh, recapitulation on my recapitulation experiences and find out that most of what I thought was my life was a gigantic lie, that I'd been lying to myself for almost all of it. And once I began to see the truth of what really happened in my life, things began to change drastically and began to be explained drastically. But that that process is very, very important because then when they try to when these beings try to put a life recapitulation on you when after you die you just can say either a i've already done this so get out of my face not interested not you have no authority over me because that's a big one authority you know it's um one of the things i talk i get a lot of people who are still really fighting hard like the mandates and the and the and the rules and the censorship which on one level i think is fine but they're, generally they're doing it because they think they can change everything here they think they can fix it as opposed to i say it's it's important that you do this but only from the realization you can never obtain ultimate freedom if you give away your relative freedom you can never give you can never gain ultimate truth if you give away relative truth so you're not doing it to fix the reality what you're doing for is to is you're doing these things to harden not hard to strengthen yourself into what are the we feel are the most important elements to the totality of your being so they act like a giant arrow to the focus of where you want to wind up because if your focus is the material world for anything that's what you're going to get like this the material is what you're going to get and the material is a giant poisoned suffering pit of hell so 
That's fine. If you want more of that, you're more than welcome to it. I'm not going to stop you. But for those of you who have decided, I'm not interested in this place anymore, like this is it, this is never going to happen again, then your intent arrow has to become, well, what is it that you do want? What is it the thing that is actually the focus, the true focus of your intention of all of your energy and your work and your time? Well, then you put that there. And if you put that there, you're you're standing then in, yeah, you're standing in your own authority and your own knowledge and your own truth, and you'll be standing eventually in your own divine spark, which is that which you really are. So the basis of a lot of these spirituality and religious teachings will begin to come to the fore, but you have to in the course of this, you'd have to go through, wipe off the top layer of just a whole lot of garbage. And when you finally get rid of the garbage and you just find the one little core that's inside of them, when you're doing this kind of work this seriously, it begins to make obvious sense. It's very, very clear what they were saying at the beginning before other human minds got a hold of them and turned them into things that are organizations and control techniques rather than escape mechanisms, which is what they were originally. You know, and I've had a massive, massive issue. Ask my mom, that poor thing, uh, with authority. Massive issue with authority the whole time growing up. And so, in especially uh, being a part of the alternative media community, even though we're not spreading fear here, but we do spread realizations and then we point out the lies that are being told to us, but not in a fear-based way. Yeah. But whenever you look at things like that, you can you can sit back and really say, hang on, it it's all bullshit. And whenever I got to the new age end of it, really what got me the last straw was I had a... Uh, it was a couple of things the it's it, mostly though what it was was i found that it was just religion with extra steps it got to the point where it needed you to believe in faith and commit faith beyond what i was willing to do which i was never willing to do i just kept it moving in the way that i kept it moving and then said okay well this will blend into the way mm -hmm. that i feel about it the way it blended in was by completely dropping off at the end of it, though, you do see that there are these little manipulation tools all around you. And in the awareness of them, that's where your power is. I, uh, now having conversations with folks, just simply adding this lens to my perception, has I can see the little traps and stories that they're doing. They're, they're playing this game within itself, and it's a whirlwind of, especially in this community, with people concerned about numbers and monetizations and all these things that they feel will validate their word and their passions. And I'm just like... Why? You know, I had a conversation the other night and these uh, amazing guys are sitting there talking about numbers um, and, and everything that they wanted to make sure that they achieved as far as quitting their jobs, but doing it this way and really having a great plan. All of it involved a ton of energy being sunk into mechanisms they have no control over, none whatsoever. I, they're sitting there talking about, and I, I give the warnings, do not sponsor content. The second that you say, hey, Facebook, here's five bucks for you to give my... Uh, I don't know, whatever out to somebody else, they're going to govern all of your shit until you pay them more money. It's a never ending cycle and it all has to do with your energy. If you're giving over your power to somebody else, which is really all this is talking about, is you going to a guru or a guide saying, I don't have the answers, will you please fill in the blanks for me? Then whatever parasite they choose to plant in there from whatever position they're in, it may be very altruistic and they may be very unaware, but it's still outside of you that you are looking to invite in you for some sort of communication. And it, when you get really deep in it is when it gets so convoluted that it's, it's heavy, it's too heavy. And so you must drop it. It's uh, the Chinese pro proverb you spoke of in your book. It's um, since the barn burned, now I can see the full moon. And it's a beautiful thing to sort of release all of that you were holding to then say, oh, wow, this is what's really left over. It's the most empowered I've ever felt, Howdy. The most empowered. Yeah. yeah and, and I was one thing I was very lucky about early on in my work was I got to meet ones that you would classify as ancient teachers. That's the best way to describe them because they they weren't creating organizations. They weren't, you know, they, they, they never asked one dollar from me for anything, although they expected me to give up whether it was time or energy or work or something. There was an exchange that would always happen, but they didn't ever say it has to be this in the exchange. It was just, you know, um, like, for example, one of the medicine men that I met for the first time, sorry, I tell often is, is um, I was told to w where to go and meet him and that um, uh, because I wanted to start learning about the sweat lodge and I want to start learning about um, native medicine. So I went to his house, I knocked on the door, I said who I was and who had sent me to him. He sent, he, he pointed to his couch and I sat down and he didn't offer me anything. So he didn't even offer me a drink. 
or, or food. And he just went and he started, he was fixing something over here. Then he was working on something else. And people came over. He talked to them. He made a phone call. He did like literally ignored me completely. And after about two or three hours of this, I started wondering, like, should I leave? Should I stay? Like, I wasn't sure what to do at this point because I was like literally ignored. And then I started to realize, well, you know what? I'm just going to sit. I'm going to sit until he tells me he doesn't want me here. So I just waited, like literally sat there and waited. And after about five hours, he finally came over to me and said, okay, come back tomorrow at 10. We'll start teaching. He was testing me to see, you know, what was I there for? Was I really there to learn? Was I willing to just wait? until, you know, and, and that's what a lot of them do. Certainly the, the native traditions, they, they test you. They're testing, in a sense, your what you're really there for. Uh, are you there to get something, steal it from them and make a few bucks off it? Or are you there to really learn about your journey and, and your own self? So uh, again, I was so lucky to have these kind of people around me right from the beginning. It, it, it helped to it helped me to separate very quickly a lot of those that I, I just knew I didn't want to listen to at all. And then there was a group that was like, okay, these could be interesting. And then I had to, it, it, it narrowed my focus so much to who I might be interested in hearing and who I might not be from. So I'm very thankful for not only what they taught me directly, but for just the general ideals of who you should even listen to for, um, for your pathway. You get another beautiful story about that. I believe in Falling First Truth about the sweat that you went to and the guy was disassembling the tent and needed to get it all cleaned and everybody was bummed out. And they're like, oh, okay, we'll go on a hike or we'll go down to the river. But you stayed and helped him clean it up. And it was an amazing altruistic reason which he wanted to do it anyway. Hey, look, all their fears and doubts and everything are left over from the other one. I needed to clean it. We need to scrub it out so that they don't get those latched onto him again. It, but the disconnect and the inconvenience that it was, was just fascinating, but you saw it for what it is. Again, you, the way that you uh, are living your life, actually this morning, because of you, the labyrinth that I told you about out here that I walk constantly, I, I, that's on my daily, I walked backwards for the first time ever. And it had to do with your pattern interruption thing of walking backwards and how you would, you know, your girlfriend that you wanted to sleep in the closet and all of these things. And it, it's this serious pattern interruption. Actually, I've got one that I could share with you. I got this little thing. Are you aware of what this is? No. Okay. Isn't that great? It's like a fart it's, maker. Yeah, it's a fart maker, but it's my yeah. pattern interruption. Right. These are great for elevators. These are great for serious times around people when they're really stressed out in a line. You put this in right. your pocket, fire one off, and just stand there. It, it's a beautiful thing to be able to really kind of troll right. this reality in a way. And this is what the other side yeah. of that nihilism looks like, this absurdism, right? Where you see mm -hmm. it all as hilarious. You know, yes, it's scary, but it's funny. I think that's another quote you use in your books. So... I, I am very curious because I'm still not clear on what we are and how the hell we got here, how we find ourselves trapped. This is going to be seven questions in one. I hope you're ready. Uh, how we find ourselves here, what the hell we are, how were we bamboozled or were, did we like volunteer for this? And, and is our realization of it our ticket out or is there still a lot of fighting that we need to do? Um, I don't want to go too much into that because I'm hoping the next book will finally start answering it. Like in a sense, I'm answering, I'm writing the book really for myself, first of all, for things like that, to just make sure I've, I've got certain. So even now, if I don't want to say too much, because I, I won't, I want to feel like I can stand behind what I say, at least and I can say, I'm pretty sure it's this. What I will say, what it appears like is what we truly are is something not from this matrix not from and by the matrix or plato's cave i mean everything right every reality every realm ev i mean the as big as you can imagine and bigger that's this entire universe and we're not from here so because we are not from here technically we are not bound by any of the laws and rules of it if we understand that so <clears throat> how did we get in here simple answer is it it either seems like we were a tricked that would be like the way the Cathars would explain it, the, the group from Southern France. They would say that there was a trick play, the Demiurge, Devil, Satan, whatever you want to call it, tricked us, tricked divine sparks to coming into this realm um, with a type of temptation. And then you might say, shut the door once we were here. Or there others, other Gnostic texts indicate there was, a, and this is probably more correct, there was a problem with this realm. 
that the, with the realm that the Demiurge made, the Demiurge created, but nothing had life. Nothing. They had the forms, but they wouldn't do anything and needed a, um, needed a life force to make it happen. So from a combination of Eve, Eve is not a woman, Eve is, is light of the life essence, brought in along with the divine spark. So you have this male and female combination coming in here together, um, in a sense, as helpers to assist the, even though the, Dem because at this point, it seems like the Demiurge may not have been the evil creature that we know, just let's say a mixed up, confused one, wasn't actually evil yet. So we came in to offer help, actually, as a, I'm simplifying it all, of course, so you have to read like the Apocrypha of John, the Gospel of Judas, and really careful terminology. Um, and then once this life began to happen, something happened to the Demiurge, and the Demiurge, let's say, became evil, became sick. And in the sickness, realized that, or it felt like they realized that if the divine sparks left, the power source for his entire matrix would leave as well. So devised a very bizarre system of entrapment. And at the same time, because if you if, if you look at this like a computer simulation and you think how massive the whole this whole universe actually is, I don't mean universe physically, I mean in its multiple layers of dimension, the amount of power that would need to require if it was a computer was enormous. But if you could find a way to get the creatures and the beings you have in your simulation to generate the power to keep it running, that's sick but ingenious. And I think that's what's been created. And what Robert Monroe in his books called Loosh is a word for this energy extraction that's constantly going on between all the beings and the system, which has the really the main purpose of going back into the system and keeping it running. So I, I'm trying to simplify a very difficult series of answers for these questions, but that, that would be the starting point, I think, for anyone looking into it. It also, to me, explains it's very important to where we are now, because as far as I'm concerned, where we are now, this simulation, the one we've known, which is not that old, actually, I, I don't think it's more than 200, maybe 500 years at the most, this one, this one is ending. It's getting ready to the point, just like the one before us ended. Uh, and I think they end when it gets to a point where the system has grown so much that it's not getting enough power from the simulation as it's structured. So in a sense, it needs to power it down for a short time and start up a new simulation that has different energetic constructs, different energy systems. That's why when we were talking about history way back at the beginning, although I didn't want to jump in. I actually don't study a lot of history anymore, or certainly history beyond 200 years, even ancient Egypt anymore, because I see those as coming from another simulation, not even from our own realm. So that was why I began to realize, well, this is why I can never understand ancient Egypt, because I'm trying to use the laws of this simulation to understand what's in a different simulation, and it wouldn't be the same. They're com two completely different things. So in a sense, all I could learn about is this is the simulation itself, I can't learn about any of the things that was in that simulation. But so when you realize what's happening is simulations and when there needs to be a new power source, everything starts to be explained of what we're going through now. All of these, we'll call them totalitarian systems and insanity and crazy ideas and whatever else that are being thrown are not for this simulation. It's not for what's happening now. It's preparing the next simulation. Because a new, uh, again, it's a simulation. So simulation means it's built on something else. So in a sense, you might think there's going to be, okay, we'll talk about where we are now. So before this simulation, at some point, there was a snapshot taken of the last one, you might say, like a perfect boom. And then it's from that snapshot, you put it into new coding and whatever and get started. And that's what they're going to do. Don't build a new simulation. Take a snapshot of this one put it into the, the next coding device and you have your new simulation. So if you want something in the next one, don't build it in the next one, build it here. And then literally you're just making a copy of it automatically when, the, when it gets made. So the things that are going on to me, which uh, at, the, at the core of all this, which would be called transhumanism or the need to make the human being a, a robot, no longer a gender classed human is... <clears throat> Energetically, if I have a system here and I have a person or a thing that I'm extracting energy from, there'll be, because there's space, energy's automatically lost because of the space. That's just science, right? So if I do this, if I combine the two together, 
I don't have to extract any more energy. I have no more energy waste because the system that's extracting and the thing I'm extracting from are together. And I think that's the core of what's going on. We're seeing the molding of the creatures into the system itself directly so that there'll be no energy loss. And I think that's what the next simulation is going to be. And they've tricked so many people into this 5D ascension. It's going to be this wonderful time of we're going to raise our frequency and our vibration. And uh, to me, D means dimension. It also means depth. It means every D means you're sinking deeper and deeper into the quicksand. So I don't want to go to 5D. I want to go to 1D because 1D would be like the original dimension, the, what, the least part of the depth. You're the closest to exiting the simulation. So for me, I'm not... I'm not so concerned. I need to stay out of the next simulation. I need to stay out of 5D. It's actually, I want to go backwards to get at least to 1D and begin the final part of the process there. But all of these things will all be part of the tricks that are going to be played really soon. I think the simulation's ending in our timeline one to five years. Somewhere within that time frame, the whole th this this simulation will end. And either, which will mean they're just going to be the greatest opportunity for divine sparks to leave because once one shuts off and the other turns down there's going to be that split second of there's no no simulation running at all so those who are aware whether they are alive or dead at the time will have the opportunity with this space to decide i'm going home so it's actually the greatest moment that everyone actually has if your true calling is to return home to whatever is true it's the greatest greatest chance we're going to have and the next simulation is going to be way way worse than this one however bad you think this one is uh, -uh. next one is going to be horrific so get out now when, when the opportunity comes when the simulations stop off you know th there's your chance go home I've got to talk to you more about this. Okay, what is it going to look like for us to go home? What is? Do you feel it's going to be something physically noticeable in our lives where we'll go, oh, we can get out now? Or uh, do you think that it's a death and then at that death we'll have the opportunity to withstand the, to resist the soul trap? Well, not necessarily. It has nothing, I mean, if, um, say for example, let's say for example I died today. Um, well, as long as I don't reincarnate and I stay in a particular they're safe places in these in in the matrix as well. They're safe air. We often call nirvana or or the void or something. There's other places, but they're they're relatively non reincarnating spaces. You can just stay in those and wait for this for whatever that opportunity is going to be. What what the opportunity actually will look like, I don't know, or what it will be experienced like, I don't know. But uh, one thing, Mr. Park, the monk, told us one time when we thought. This was back because I was with him on September 11th. And when um, when a whole bunch of people were around thinking it was going to World War III was starting and they're like, what do we do? And Mr. Park just said, well, you just stay connected to your spirit because if something then needs to happen, the spirit will talk to you and tell you exactly what to do. And then you just trust it and you do it. Oh, right. So we asked, I remember we asked him, so what do we do now? And he said, well, exercises. I was like, right, it, it doesn't matter if World War III is starting or not. We have exercises to do. We have practices that we have to do. Why would I Why would I be any different today uh, than I was the day before? So we just went back to doing our exercise. So I think it'd be something the same. It would be this sense of as long as someone is, because it's going to get more chaotic and it's going to get more and more crazy. I mean, as beyond what anybody can even think as the simulation comes to an end. And all of that will be an ex another external distraction. That's an, one reason it, they want it to be so chaotic is because then the focus again is out there, not here. So when the moment is there, someone whose main focus remains like 80 to 90%, you might say within and in the, in the, 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 the true observer consciousness, you'll know when the, you'll know when the doorway is there and you'll know, your, what your opportunity is, and you'll you'll be able to make your decision at that moment. But if your focus is only on the external or what what I need to do to you know run here, run there, you, you you'll miss it.
you'll miss the you'll miss the opportunity. Uh, Carlos Castaneda wrote a whole book on this kind of idea called Power of Silence, which is all about what he called intent opening doorways for us to move into completely different realms, you might say completely different opportunities, but you had to be so aware and so present to notice when the doorway was actually finally there or you would miss it. So this is it's that idea just on a bigger scale. So I think and again, just what I think, but my thought process leads me, research leads me to feel that when the opportunity is there, uh, your job is just to know it. And, uh, and and it could be your doorway might be different than my doorway. So even if I knew what my doorway was going to look like, it would do me no good to tell you because yours might look completely different to you. And so we also don't want to get too tricked on that. We just, it's just, do I, have I learned how to trust what I truly am? And then what have I learned to listen to what I truly am? And when the time comes, I'll just trust that and follow it. You mentioned earlier that uh, things like uh, probably the Bhagavad Gita or the Nag Hammadis or anything like that are from an older civilization. Uh, let's say back mm -hmm. in time, let's say in a copy of an earlier age or an earlier time period. Do you feel that when the copy happened, and I know we're speculating wildly here, it's just leading to another question. Do you feel that when the copy happened, there's still a connection to the old realm? Basically that they need to stack on each other like uh, stacked or vertical time as explained, or do you think it's a literal another file that they carbon copied and then now this is realm 201 rather than realm O? Do you think that it's separate right. like that or that there's a bridge between yep. the two? No, I think there's there's... There at times we get things which I guess now we would call a reset. They're trying to use throw that word around, but I actually think we're in a restart. But a reset would just be something's not going too well too well in the simulation, so we just need to alter it a bit. We'll you know we'll just we'll we'll, we'll throw we'll, we'll we'll drown out some things and clean it up. I think that's maybe what happened in like the 1800s. We had a, a reset where they just needed to kill off a bunch of people and destroy a bunch of stuff and and create a brand new story, create a brand new um because it's it th this is why it's so difficult when you begin realizing you're in a simulation. Uh and there's there's lots of reasons you can start begin like how do you know you're in a simulation? Well, we can go into it. There's ways you can kind of figure out you are in one. But once you realize you're in a, a type of simulation, a simulation has a start date. You know, there's a moment that any video game time-wise starts. There's actually nothing before that in a simulation or a video game or anything else, right? But there's backstory, just like a Westworld robot. A Westworld robot got started on day one when the park opened, but they have a they've been programmed a belief that they had 40 years of life before that, which never actually happened. It's just story put into their into their into their coding right so from this so our problem is we don't know when the simulation started so what if let's just let's just blow people's minds what if the simulation started july 9 2007 that means every single thing that would ever happen in our lives before that is just westworld backstory never actually happened it's just things that were programmed into our head. They're not even part of our own actual real experience in the simulation. That's how weird this all gets when you begin to recognize the simulation. Most people begin to, oh yeah, okay, Earth is 4,000 or 4 billion years or whatever. It's a simulation. No, I mean, it might be, it might be so tied up and blocked off that it's tight. Or we've got the other problem, which is another thing that, that I've talked about in Falling for Truth and in other books is that we're probably dealing as well with parallel realities or if not parallel realities, uh, looped realities, where there's not just one me and there's not just one you. That would make no sense. If I'm putting a, a character into an experiment, which is what a simulation is, then you need to run multiple times of the experiment in order to get actual simulation data, right? All about data. So it's all about get. So it makes sense if there's a million me's, not one me. And I've had the experience of myself dying in parallel realities. I've tracked them and I found out, you know, what I, what careers I had, who I've been married to, and all of them kind of made sense. They were nothing that was out of the ordinary with just one or two changes in my life, maybe a change here and a change there. That exact life I had just seen would have been totally logical. So it brings up like it brings up for me like it, it also started for me not only when i first had these the experience kind of when i saw myself die in that life in this other life which again i'm not saying it's a parallel reality it might be a looped reality right we might just be like in a time loop like a giant uh 
Ken Grimwood replay novel where we're just Groundhog Day. We're just going it over, over living our life again and again and again, which is also highly likely. Um, um, but when I, when you have a dream at night and the dream is really, really vivid and it's an experience. And I have a couple of these, uh, but I used to dream about a lot, S- similar experiences with similar people. And then I would wake up and be, oh yeah, I'm remembering that experience again. Yeah, I know, whatever. And I go on with my day and I'd be, wait a minute, but I never had that experience. I don't know those people, but yes, I do. I do know those people and I have had those experiences and I would have these battles with myself in the morning. Like, and I know that if I called people, I know and tried to say, do you, do you remember anything about these people? And what are you talking about? And I, it wasn't until I understood from these experiences of the deaths of the death I went through. Um, and, and that, Oh, these are uh, what's happening when I'm dreaming is I'm obviously crossing into parallel realities, realities, different lives are bleeding into each other. So I am seeing something that me as in the character known as Howdy McCoskey has gone through in his life. He has had that experience, but not this one, a different one had that experience. So my consciousness or my awareness had just shifted from me to that other one. Um, So it's a real experience in a sense to me, but not a real experience to the me here. So once you begin putting all of this perspective into what we're calling matrix reality, and again, you begin to see, well, no wonder our lives are so fucked up because, you know, it, it, even just that, if you take, there's actually 10 million me's living 10 million different lives, getting 10 million different data points for a giant simulation experiment. Well, who told me that when we started? Who gave me that information about my life? And um, so it, it, it it can throw you, and it did throw me for a while into bizarre areas. It, it it was hard sometimes to get out the more I saw of how things really were, but I needed to see some of this to eventually get to this point where I can talk about it and comfortably present it to others who may be going through, who have had similar experiences and kind of realize, well, you're not crazy. You're actually seeing the way reality is set up. So for me, I see Probably what will happen when this simulation ends is there's three options. Option one, some divine sparks, trueness will leave and go home, will exit the matrix. Very, not many, but some will. Um, Some will go into the next more horrible simulation. There will be a third group, though, who I think they're, they're not able or ready or want to leave. They're not interested in going into the next one. So they'll just be time looped back. I, I like so when you talk about do does it does the do there a bridge or whatever? What I think happens is once the new simulation is made, the old simulation loops back with whatever's left and goes back to five hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, two and whatever it starts. Yeah, so that one will loop back, and then what will happen is there will be a whole lot of people that are missing. Some have gone to the next simulation. Some souls have left. So now we need to build what we know as NPCs, non-player characters, to fill in the roles that, of beings that are no longer there anymore to keep the story and the simulation running. So, are there a lot of NPCs in our world? Yeah, there's a ton of NPCs in our world, but that's because. Uh, through all of the various loops, others, some have left and some have gone into a different simulation, not the one that this one's going to go to, but that doesn't mean other loops haven't gone to other simulations, which, you know, so once you put this into this vastness, it becomes this realization, like I talk about in chapter two of Exit the Cave, you can study the cave forever. The cave Plato's cave is so massive and so complex and so detailed, you can study it forever, and some do. And some just literally will be trapped with lifetime after lifetime studying the cave. You have to study the cave for a while. You have to figure out how things work here. You have to figure out kind of how you can manipulate the cave a bit to your advantage so that you can control your energy for what you need. But eventually, there comes a point in time where you say, okay, I know enough about the cave. I don't need to study the cave anymore. I need to study the exit and the way home. And that's one of the, again, that's one of the biggest, as soon as somebody tries to do that, it's like the system sort of zeroes in on them and says, ah, let's throw this garbage at you now, because that's the only thing that that the matrix doesn't want, you looking for an exit. It'll let you do anything else, but the possibility of going, it's going to make that really, really difficult. And that's why we need a tremendous intent, a tremendous um, intention, a tremendous clarity, and a tremendous amount of energy. 
do you, and this is fascinating, what you said about the the simulation resetting, because now, like you said, in the 1800s, when we're looking at the World's Fairs and all of this with the pictures, and I've seen several things that you've gone over, uh, Matt from Great Deception, of course, who you know as well, uh, he goes over these incredible pictures where you can see muddy streets everywhere um, and these amazing buildings with just a few folks laying around. And then you look at the idea of the foundlings, and we're introduced to this idea that hundreds of thousands of children just showed the hell up out of nowhere, orphans, and then were trained across the U.S and disperse to now what are probably NPCs setting this place up for those divine sparks that were reincarnated into those cabbage patch type, you know, maybe literal fields of cabbage patch babies popping out and then thrown on trains and then bust over. It, because that's what they say those, um, a lot of folks say, and you probably concur with as well, is that the World Fairs were indoctrination periods of an erasing of the old mentality and bringing in the new world order, the new way things were to work, the new perception right. management. Man, it was it was a propaganda. It was, they were propaganda machines. I find it so interesting now that, of course, because I wrote that book in 2019. I wrote it before even any of this craziness started. So it was quite amazing that I was talking about resets and and things already in in the book as <clears throat> before any of this happened. And. Um, it was it was a valuable tool for me. It was a very important tool to write that book, actually, and, and to go into something that I just found so fascinating. Um, and it's kind of what I got partially got known for for a while. But it's so interesting looking now where, I mean, it's exploded. Everyone's talking about now world fairs. All these people are doing videos on them. It's kind of like uh, I've kind of been forgotten. And even the ones who were kind of before me, you know, not even John Levi. There were some people before him that were – uh, were a, a Russian guy, Philip. He was one of the originals. There was a there was a, a woman, Sylvie. There was a few different people from like seven, eight, ten years ago who were beginning this this subject. And kind of all these original the originals have been forgotten, and which is okay, you know, it's it's fine. But it's just I find it interesting that um, that kind of that's the way it works. The new generation picks up the work and kind of sometimes forgets to mention the old generation that brought them there so to speak and i i try to do I, that's why i mentioned like things like you know wayne bush's site like uh, wayne bush's site was valuable to me for building exit the cave and helping to understand it as i was going through my work um so i always think it's important for people to share where when it's not when it's, because we have of course my own experience on my own work and my own act but there's also things that came from others so make sure you you, you know you try to share that but uh yeah the world fairs i would classify as indoctrination centers before movies, before television, before ways that you could mass program uh, a whole lot of people, um, this is this was a great way to do it. Where you take a basic, similar functioning thing and just keep putting it over and over and over and over again all over the world. And those people that were coming to it because you had to be elite and have money, you wouldn't be able to go to these fairs without them. They would be all the teachers, all the university professors, anybody who had any influence anywhere. And then you have this mass, like you say, this group of just orphans or this massive group of immigrants or this massive group of whoever you just all of a sudden shove in your city who are going to go to the people who just been to the world's fair well i can teach you history because i've just been to the world's fair and the smithsonian just told me everything about what happened in the u.s civil war and with george custer and well so that has to be true they it's the teacher and they went to the world fair how could it be wrong within a generation and you've got you've been able to take whatever ideas you want to put out about the world this particular re like so weird if if you anyone wants to look into anything any system almost financial government uh education science medicine it all has its origin really between 1850 and 1900 pretty much it's like the they could say well uh, it comes from this before it comes from rome but really the formation of it yeah it was like 1874 eight, all of it everything was like structured in this 50-year time period and that would make sense if there was actually nothing here before that and they were literally like i say wiping one thing out putting a whole new thing in and these fairs were the indoctrination center so from that mindset if this happens again and is happening again, well, what will be the world fairs of like the next simulation that will be the indoctrination tool for what's coming, right? Well, and we're seeing that, this. That's now. why that's why I think the study of them is so important because literally we're seeing the end of one thing and the beginning of something else, like actually laid out and with obvious photographic distorted lies. So we actually have photo photographs that are obvious lies of all this stuff. And 
Well, you're talking about those these photos of San Francisco, which are some of the biggest the panoramas, which are some of the biggest lies you can ever possibly imagine for a story. They're right there, and um, they're they're a value not to learn about what happened in the 1800s. It's to learn about oh, what's happening right now. That's the same. That's why it's important, and that's where too many of the researchers get stuck. They spend their time looking that way, trying to figure that out. It's like actually that doesn't matter. What matters is is what you're going to be going through in six months. Are you ready for it? And the indicator back there, why it's valuable though, is because exactly like you said, all the institutions with mm-hmm. Rockefeller, with the education, medical, everything occurred at about the same time. The foundlings, all of the the buildings left over, which I've got to right. ask you about, physical evidence left over from the last simulation. But before that, uh, Arthur Furstenberg yeah. also is talking about how, you know, and uh, allegedly we had a different relationship with energy and how we powered things around here. Uh, the, the work of Tesla comes to mind. But when Arthur Furstenberg talks about in his book, The Invisible Rainbow, about the early touches of electricity and how it was being introduced and how it was dangerous. And then with the introduction of every new technology since comes about a pandemic that the world experiences collectively that shocks us, right? In a way that the ancients or whatever civilization was operating before that didn't experience. This seems to me a new way. The petroleum industries, the government, everything being so monopolized outside of your ability to actually power or run your car or anything like that off of water or something renewable or right, any of those types of things. But the question really is, is about the leftover stuff laying around all over the place. Why isn't this place just clean swept like entirely and we're just implanted into just like Dark City? We're just wake up into a dark world we don't understand with memory implants and then there you go. It's fascinating to me why they leave things around all over the place after each reset. Do you think it's for clues or is this just like a tacky place that just can't really function properly without being noticed for its falsities? No, again, like I said, it's just easier. Right. It's easier to make a copy of something than it is to, to build from something else. Like if you wanted to build a video game, it would take you a lot less time. If I could give you, oh, I've got one here. Why don't you just make some coding changes to it and then just change it from a car game to a, you know, a banking game or change it from this game to a sports game? You know, it's change this soccer game to a baseball game. So that's kind of what it's doing. It's it's saving time from the standpoint of the coding of the new simulation to take the old one and just start working from it. Kind of like the Devil's Tower. Um, it was a tree before, but now it's just a mountain because we didn't have those trees. And because when the simulation ended, it wasn't. It was a tree cut down, and so the new one started like that. You know, it just started with it there, and all you have to do is start changing the, or just start adding explanations as to what it is to explain it. Okay, that's what it is. No one will, will think it's from a different simulation when because each simulate the rules will be different. That's the big thing when you realize a, a simulation is not any. It won't be just a copy. It will be a copy, and then again, we're talking about upgrades. So they're changing the way the energy structure. It means they've got to change the coding of how everything works. Then it begins to make sense why they're why they're doing what they're doing and how it's how in sense it's done like that. Um, so when we recognize that, we're recognizing all of this old stuff is a copy of what was. It's again why like why you can't really use like the Egyptian pyramids for exactly what they were originally used for. Now, I've had spectacular experiences in all of them, whether it be at Dashu or Abu Sir or Saqqara or Giza or whatever. I've had like truly monumental experiences in all of those pyramids. And I've they're, they're, you know, hours worth of potential discussions of what's happened. But now I realize, but there's only a point you can ever go with them because they were built to function in a different simulation. So they're built to function under different energy construction, under different, uh, what you might call computer coding. And so we can never use them completely for what they were used for. Hence, we will never truly be able to understand them because they only truly function in that world, that simulation, not ours. It was one of the things I got when I first went, actually, it was even before that, when I went to Teotihuacan the first time in Mexico, and when I was there, I felt like I was in another universe. Uh, and at first I thought, I'm I, I'm so old. I'm in a civilization that is so far different than what's here now, who, who had so much more knowledge or more wisdom. That's how I thought then. And I was that I but I was literally felt like I was somewhere else, that I wasn't here in this world I know when I'm at Teotihuacan. 
Now, of course, I would say I'm actually, it's still a bridge point. You might say the old simulation still exists in some of these places that were true power centers in each of those simulations. And we can, we're kind of touching that time a little bit. We're recognizing that its base, its energetic base is something else. It's mathematical, it's geometric. Everything is a little different than all of the things we have in ours. So we're, we're sensing that, we're feeling that, and we are being energized by it. Um, but there then becomes a point to how much we can know. Um, same thing here. I live in Norway now, and there's hundreds of stone circles here in this country, which is so strange because Norwegians don't know about them. They fly to England, right, to go to the stone circles there. <laughs> um, but each of them are still incredible energetic constructs. They're still uh, tremendous. I've had tons of people get all kinds of healing who've come to me from, from the stones just by being there. Uh, and I've worked for a while trying to understand the complete depth of not only why they were built, but what you do with them. How do you, and I knew they're, they're energetic grids. They're like, they're like acupressure points on the earth, acupuncture points on the earth. They're like, there's so many variables, but now that I realize, but actually they're from the previous simulation. So uh, actually I would have to like build a brand new stone circle in this simulation, you know, to, to, and have, have it function for this one. Kind of like you're saying, you built a labyrinth at your house and you might go like, there's an ancient labyrinth about eight hours from Oslo. Well, your labyrinth has more chance of functioning as a labyrinth should because it's built in our simulation as opposed to mm -hmm. that one, which we built in the old one. Now we take maybe Chartres. Now, I don't know which simulation Chartres is, will be from. <laughs> it's it's on, the, it's on the edge. So it might still be fully active. But when we think like that, we can begin to recognize what we can what we can do with these ancient sites and what we can't do with the ancient sites. And we don't, again, we don't give up too much energy and time trying to do something that we actually can't do. Uh, and we can refocus that to doing the same thing, like with a group of trees and some rocks and some something by a PowerPoint by an ocean. And we don't need to necessarily be at an ancient old site to do something very, very powerful and deep for ourselves or other people. Mind blowing, howdy, mind blowing. What about what about the idea? And you're just inspiring so much here. Let's say that you said that the simulation restarts again, and that um, the new one will continue on. There's a new one that's functioning, but that an old one will reset, and so therefore that one's still playing in, let's say, linear time against this one. Yeah. Let's say times the same and times measured the same. Let's say in all of the simulations. Mm -hmm. but just for simplicity's sake. And let's say that one's spinning on underneath ours, this one's spinning on underneath, and now we're up to 4D, right? The 5D is the next level, right? That's the one that we're pumped about getting to. The pyramids, mm -hmm. let's say, that were made or constructed and- Go down though. Yeah, It's yeah, not up, yeah. it's down. Oh, okay. Oh, right, because you're descending like a like Dante, right? So let's say that we mm -hmm. go back out to the first one, or uh, you know, one where the pyramids were constructed, they were functioning perfectly. And when you're in sacred sites and you get this, you, these glimpses of these ancient places like Teotihuacan, maybe what you are accessing is the former simulation energetically, and you can physically go there. Like, let's say a time travel just for the sake of it, but it's more of a mental time travel. Let's say time travel exists. You can then backtrack yourself up to level one when the pyramids were a thing. Do you think that that's possible to recapitulate your life literally back through your old lives, a, a side of the memory? Oh. Right? Um, yes, it's certainly possible. Um, the Maya or the um, Hopi and the Navajo, they used to talk about, because they talk about we're in the fifth world now, or we're in the fourth world going on the fifth, I can't remember. They speak about various worlds, and they, but they would say, if you want to see the old world, there's certain rocks you could lift on the ground and you could look at the old world from where we come from, like which indicates, set. yeah, they're, 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 so it's still running. Like you say, it's, it, it, it's moving in, in, in its own time and its own space time. Um, it's just, and we, so you can access them if you really want to. Sure. There's no reason why you couldn't. There's no reason, but the point, but there would be, what, is, what good is that going to do for you? It's going to be just providing more information about the cave, more information about the matrix. It's not giving you any information about exiting. But you're closer to is the it, original. You see one. the problem? I, I do, but then that's my question. Now, okay, really. yeah. So if you, you if you, yeah, if you want, if you wanted to understand the origin of of the matrix itself, then yes, that would be a reason to go back and do this. Because the further you go back in the simulation, the that's that's something. For example, that uh, I, I mentioned. In, first chapter of my new book that I'm writing is um, 
So I talk about the Nag Hammadi fragments, for example. I know they're from the previous simulation or eight, one of them before. So they're of less help for us now into where we're going, but they're more help of understanding the origin because they're closer to the complete origin of this simulation than we are now. So if you think of it, if you're doing it for that reason, then yes, there would be value. If it's though you're going back there to try to experience and understand something and use it in a sense here, then you're going to be back on the hamster wheel of of wasted exploration. Perfect. It would same be like thing going- with past lives, right? Like people are digging through tons and tons of past lives, and it's like, well, what for? All you're doing is seeing more suffering that you went through, more more horrors and more whatever. That's actually not helping you get out. It's almost potentially sinking you deeper in. Some well, I'm I'm releasing some karma. I'm releasing some. Well, you don't have any karma. The karma is all a giant karma, sin. All of this is just a gigantic game that's being played with you. It's just see the see the matrix clearly and honestly, and then make your decision based on that. The, eventually, there's always a point where you have to say, I know enough about it. I need to know about me. I need to know about, and not me as in this thing, because that's part of the work. Eventually, you have to say, I know, I, I know this thing pretty good. What's the real thing? What what am I really? What am I really? What is the real true thing? And so once you start doing that, then when that focus goes totally internal into what capital S self is, kind of all the rest of it doesn't really matter anymore in the exploration. It doesn't. The way that I would see it to be beneficial, yeah, wouldn't be to grab information like maybe selfishly archaeologists would like to go back, find out how the pyramids were made, bring them to our current understanding and relay sure. that, right? But really what mm-hmm. it would be more in my, because I'm on a very selfish endeavor here with this. I'm about to share it with everybody, but I'm on a very selfish endeavor since you, man, I'll be honest with you. Because even as I look yeah. at this, I'm thinking, how can we how can we trust that you're, what you're talking about is correct? And how can we trust that this isn't another angle from the dark forces to keep us from actually recycling mm-hmm. here to keep on our path, but to get us to exit the cave to start back over le- shoots and ladders to the beginning? I'm asking sure. all the questions, right? But with this, yeah. what, I, what, I'm, what I'm diving to even further with this, though, is, is if there are mechanisms of operation where we can jump back up the levels, let's say, to a period of time to where we weren't that far removed and we weren't that... Uh, deep in the delusion of it all to where things were a little bit more transparent. And from this perspective of being bamboozled as much as we have been five levels deep, maybe we have a much better shot at it back then. And maybe then, even then, I don't know, we can plant some things if we feel a responsibility to do so. Yeah, that's another potential theory. If if um, what I haven't dug into too, uh, too much, but I can understand your thinking process, right? So if I could somehow move my consciousness out of this body and into a body, say in the 2D simulation, yes, move it a little bit higher back up in the simulation. So, uh, which would mean everything would be different and the trapping mechanisms would be different. The escape mechanisms would be different. And when talk, when they talk about a golden age, of t- that's probably true. The earlier simulations were probably not as messy as insane as these were they'd still be insane right when, when you when you say you would still look at them carefully but the level of insanity would be like way yeah the different way lower so from that perspective it, it could offer if that if you could do that and if you could move your awareness fully out of here and into there and work your and do start doing work from that one that 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 could have um theory uh the problem all, always there's always traps always. and tricks in that then because <laughs> One of the reasons somebody would want to do that is because, of course, well, this is so painful and so difficult. And you get into that one and all of a sudden it's it's so much better. You know, like I could just imagine, never mind that, being able to go live in like a, a Iroquois or a Cherokee village 500 years in our timeline ago. I'm sure living with clean water, clean air, um, people who are living in a caring for village for each other with knowledge of plants and herbs and the nature and interaction with it, I'm sure it would be way better than this. So the problem would be, I go back, I spend a week or two down there, I get accepted by the tribe. Why would you want to leave? It's so much, it's so much more wonderful than this. So the problem could be, I mean, symbolically, you go into something that might have been really good in the early simulations, which is why the demiurge stopped it. It's like, hey, this is this is too good. We need to we need to more we need to create more suffering here. Um, you go back into that, and you might think this is fine, because that's a that's a as I talk about that's such a huge trap generally on the spiritual search. Most people, 
99% get into the spiritual search. And in some way I did as well at the way at the beginning was I'm in pain. I'm in suffering. I'm looking for ways to stop suffering. And as such, as soon as somebody find a way where they can all of a sudden feel better, because that's what they were truly looking for, they will stop one way or another, as opposed to I'm looking for ultimate truth. So I want to, that was uh, Schopenhauer's uh, uh, understanding. Right? Schopenhauer figured out the world is the prison, but he didn't figure out to look for an exit. He sort of took a Buddhist perspective of, okay, if we're in prison, then the best thing we can do is not look for happiness, which is another wheel on the on the trap. It's to how do I reduce suffering? It sounds like it's two different things, searching for something happy or reducing suffering, but they're actually completely different. So his point was live in such a way where you reduce your suffering and the suffering to anyone else to the as bare minimum as possible, and you will actually have a much better function. Now, I've looked through his work trying to find, does he talk about then and using the extra energy you saved to, let's say, leave this reality. I don't find that, interestingly, in any of his work, which uh, would have, I, I searched hard. Um, but his ideas are still valid for, you might say, functioning here in a better way. But again, without the intention of seeing through that this will never get better, this will never improve, this will never ever be a wonderful, happy, joyous place, then it's like, right, I don't ever need to be in this any longer. I've, the only thing I needed to figure out, I just figured out, right. It's a giant pit of hell. So like you talked about Dante. So I bought Dante's book, for example, well, I can pull off the shelf, but the, the Divine Comedy, right? The whole, not the, uh, the whole thing, all three things. Of it. Thinking that originally he was talking about exiting the matrix. That's what I thought the book was, his, his three things was about. So I bought it with the idea, well, that can be like a running thread in my new Exit the Cave 2 book. And, until I, and I started reading it carefully, and I realized he had a near-death experience. That's what happened. He had the standard near-death experience that we hear about with the with the white light and the and the in this case, instead of Jesus, it's all of the uh, uh, beings of his, um, you know, um, philosophical heritage is Beatrice woman and and the love and the whatever and showing the 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 dangerous realms or the things that were are taking him away from this this beautiful light and the beautiful and and he wrapped it up in this beautiful wonderfully written poetic experience but when you study enough near death experience you're like that's it he's he's writing about the standard near death experience and I'm like oh I get it now it's beautiful. It's poetic. It's wonderfully written. And if like anyone who's who's uh, researching near death experiences reads the book from that perspective, I'm sure they'll say that's exactly what he's describing. But he's not describing the ten percent of near death experiences that are nothing like the standard ones that are showing this is a pit run by a bunch of demonic beings that are tricking us at every our every angle and we have to learn how to get by all the deception. So in a sense, from the standpoint of exiting the matrix, even Dante becomes a deception. And then like you just said, everyone should be sitting back and saying, well, how do they know I'm not a deception of what I'm saying? I mean, at least I know myself personally, it's not intentional. I'm not trying to deceive anyone, but you don't know that. And you have to like take all this stuff personally and look into it yourself and examine it and question it and not accept it and not disregard it either to really look into it and really begin to say, um, because that that's an obvious thing that happens here. Always it's present information in a twisted backwards upside down way so that it seems useful and truthful, but turns out if you follow it to just take you deeper into another trap. And um, so it be, the best the best thing I can way I can describe someone who's working through all of this is think of it like you're you're putting together a giant jigsaw puzzle. And anyone you think that has some valuable information, me included, I maybe got one piece of the jigsaw puzzle. Maybe I figured out one piece. So what's the one piece you think I've figured out? Great. You can put that in the, go find somebody else. What's their piece? Go find someone else. What's their piece? And eventually, if you bring it all together, you'll have a completed jigsaw puzzle. But don't ever trust, no matter how much, high you think of somebody, that they've got all the pieces together. If they had all the pieces together, they would be gone. They would not be here. And that's my question. Do you think that there comes to a point with this to where we just 
queef out of existence to where you just literally walk through like, a door will open in your reality where you go, you know what? I've learned enough. I'm done. Door manifest. It does. And then you walk out it. Do you think that that's possible? Kind of. Yes. Who knows? It might even be the experience known as for some people, a spontaneous human combustion, which yes. has always made me really curious. Like what, <laughs> what causes somebody to get so hot internally that they literally burn up and that something like this could be a possible answer. You know, they, they, they see the totality of everything as the way it really is. And they, because probably I would love to look into the experiences. My guess is somebody who's died from spontaneous human combustion was not having a wonderful, happy life. They were not having a, a joy. They were probably going, have gone through a lot of trauma, a lot of difficulty, a lot of great pain. And maybe that's what happened to them. They, they found the opportunity because what what's so challenging a good friend of mine now norio kushi who's written some really interesting really really good guy really wonderful just a wonderful person actually um he reminds that the it's only the truest thing of you that exits the matrix everything else which will be body mind experiences hopes dreams fears memories uh, anything else that's all from the matrix that is all that doesn't leave. That all has to, in a sense, be disengaged from or let go of. If you, any of those things are being held on to, it doesn't leave. It can't leave. All of that has to go, and only that which you truly are is which leaves the matrix. So exiting the cave is really about, it's not about knowing what you truly are. Find, it, it's, as I talked about, Richard Rose used to say, it's about finding false and dropping it. Something is, you know, this is wrong, this is false, this is a lie, and you let go of it, and you just keep doing that over and over and over and over again until you come to the one thing that no matter how hard you try to drop it, how hard you try to get rid of it, you can't. You can't find it as false. Well, that's the truth. That's what you really are. And that's the recognition then of that's what will exit the matrix. Nothing else will. And as long as we still think me, uh, anything about me will exit the matrix, you're not leaving. Uh, so if it happened like instantaneously, if this moment happened, obviously that thing would go. Well, what happens to the body? Does it just, would it just continue to function like a semi, you know, like a robot or would it just die? My guess is it probably would just die. So in some cases, I would think some deaths that are just unexplained, like the person was sitting here five minutes ago and now they're dead, could be somebody had done enough inner work that nobody really knew about. Somebody had asked enough deep questions coming out of trauma. And that's another thing we should talk about before this ends is the importance of, because my journey started out of trauma. A lot of people have had trauma way worse than me. My traumas were difficult for me, but some people's lives are horrific by comparison. So I'm not trying to say like, hey, I've had this horrible traumatic life. I mean, the trauma was enough to get me to turn away from the world and turn within and go through a lot of pain and and, uh, you know, to the point I want to kill myself, it was it was enough to do that. But when you have trauma, do <clears throat> you have the possibility of either ignoring it, distracting from it, surviving from it, which is what most of us have to do. At some point, though, some might start asking really deep questions or asking why, why are we in a world where this kind of trauma exists? Why, you know, it's and not not looking at it from a what's wrong with me. Why did God do this to me? Why am I being punished? Is instead seeing why has the world been created where this can possibly happen? A deeper exploration starts coming out of the trauma. And now all of a sudden that person might be able to see, I can use this. It's not like it's not like it's not a gift. It hasn't been given to you. It's not there, not there to help you. It's you can use the horror to take you to some place that even the matrix doesn't want you to go. And it's unfortunately why generally anybody who might listen to someone like me and say, this guy makes a lot of sense. If someone doesn't have a lot of trauma in their life, or at least has a close family member who's gone through some horrible stuff, what I say is just going to go, it's going to be, this guy's nuts. This is a waste of, but if it's only when you've had this kind of stuff and then done the requisite internal questioning about reality from it, that someone can start to say, that's a possibility for this, for answers to this realm. And so if somebody does all that work, like I know I had spirit, a lot of people over the years have talked to me, you know, I don't really do any meditation. I'm not very spiritual. I don't. Yeah. But you had that divorce, right? Yeah. Have you asked a lot of questions about yourself? Well, yeah. I, you know, I wondered about myself and why I went through it and, 
and why I was the way I was. And I worked hard. I've made a lot of changes. And well, that's spiritual work. What do you mean? Well, that's actual spiritual work. That's looking at your life, looking at your experience, looking at who you were during those experiences. That's it. Sitting with your eyes closed is not really spiritual work. That might get you ready for it, but that's not it. So a lot of people are probably doing more work than they really think of just because the standard guru mindset doesn't indicate what real work is because if it was, you wouldn't need them and you wouldn't be going to spend a whole bunch of money buying all their uh, weekend retreats and their, you know, all the crap they're selling um, because it's just that. It's just constantly inner seeking on yourself and asking why, what's going on, who was I doing that, why did that occur? So that trauma if you use it, will take you to the place where, and so maybe, yeah, some people, when they they, they, it, they do it, they do the work, they realize they can go, they just go, they're tired of this place anyway, and um, their body just falls off. Now, I don't, by any chance, I'm not saying to anyone that they should commit suicide. I get a lot of emails on that. Well, if the place is a horrible realm, why don't we commit suicide? And the, the point I make is, well, the problem is, if, if you commit suicide right now, well, you think you're getting out of the pain and the suffering, which theoretically you might for a short period of time. You're going to go into this after death realm, guaranteed you're not, you're probably not ready to escape the matrix. You don't know all the deceptions. You haven't done all the work. So all that's going to happen is one way or another, you'll be tricked to come back in here. Guaranteed they'll trick you because, well, you killed yourself. So, well, you're obviously some sort of coward. So back you go, you have to go in a new life and learn about love or helping others. You're back in the matrix and the next life may be way more horrible than this one. So the point being is while you've got time, no matter how difficult life is, while you've got time, while you've got work to do, do the work. Like you've got the opportunity, you've got the possibility of looking in, in another life, you may not. The next life literally might be so bad, you don't even have a chance at all. So do it now. Do it while you've got the chance because you're going to die anyway. It's guaranteed. It's coming. You know, one way or another, you will, you're not making it through. Physical body is not going to make it through. So don't rush the process. Now, you know, at a certain moment of a Cathar's life when they were very old and they were <clears throat> near death anyway, they would do some sort of particular experience. They don't call it a consolamentum, uh, priests and ceremony and all sorts of things. And then they might just, they might just, you know, stop eating at that point and speed up the process. But they're, it's like they're already at that point anyway. And they feel now they've completed their work. So, okay, they can move on with it. But, you know, 99.9999999% of people who are ever thinking, I think I should kill myself, is just incorrect thinking because you wouldn't be ready to escape the matrix from that kind of um, manner. It would be better to know who and what you really are because that's what's going to escape the matrix anyway. And if you can reach that, then you'll realize, well, it doesn't really matter what happens to the physical form. Physical form can just go on and do its thing. We, we kind of Once you see you're just a robot, an actor in a movie, all you're trying to really look for is not to stop being a robot. You're just looking to start seeing what are the few things that I can control that are not, that are not part of the robot that's actually important to my totality, and the robot can just keep doing what it does. I I just have a million questions for you. We're gonna we're gonna cap it here soon because I feel like I've kept you long enough. Uh, but one thing I do want to ask you about is just kind of a fun little inverted question here: the map. What do you think about ancients? Uh, I uh, watched this video recently. It was brilliant, and it refers to how ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia were actually in the United States rather than over where they say that they are in Africa, and that this is actually Africa. And that the ancients used to view our map inverted. So therefore, the South Pole, of course, would be the North. And there is no such thing as a North Pole because this expanse just kept going as some of the views go. The question to that is, is then because it inverts all of the directional uh, coordinates noted in any ancient text, that then East becomes West and all of these things, right? So also to this, I heard just as a, as a side note uh, for the theory here was that America, the U.S., has the most man-made lakes out of any other country. We have flooded out massive areas of places to hide past in certain areas. Some of them seem to correspond mm. if you lay the text over with some of these maps to what are ancient sites that may be related in America. So I'm just curious about what your thoughts are on it. Um, I've heard of little pieces of that. And of course, I've heard lots of <clears throat> Grand Canyon talk and things yes. that are 
yes. potentially there, right? Um, but even still, um, the problem is, is when we talk about ancient Egypt, let's say pharaonic Egypt, right? We're talking about old kingdom, new kingdom Egypt. That's maybe two or three simulations ago. Pyramids, the big pyramids, the big sites, the megalithic sites, that's at least one or two simulations before that. So it also becomes challenging, of, of, of again, trying to figure out what's from what simulation and what goes together with, with what. Um, or someone would talk about, I'm trying to find Atlantis. Well, Atlantis isn't a location, it's a time, for example. it's a, it's a It would be the name of a simulation. So the entire of this world, material world, would be Atlantis. It's not in one place, it's everywhere. So when you begin sort of getting that point, then if you're seeing Egypt as the name of a time frame of a, let's say, of a particular simulation, then you would find that simulation everywhere. It's like when people are looking into um, <clears throat> this sort of Greco-Roman architecture that was uh, symbolic with the fairs or with, uh, if we take the U.S., for example, like all of your state capital buildings, which are just you know, they might as well be in downtown Rome, right? Yeah. Every single one is just magnificent and spectacular and f beyond what someone in 1830 would need to build in Iowa or Oklahoma or whatever. But when you see it, it's not from an area, it's from a time uh, universal around the earth that actually what was ancient Rome and became modern Rome, what was ancient Greece and what we find in the Americas and everywhere else, it's all from the same time period, the same simulation, the same building period, it all starts to make sense what we're looking at, that, uh, again, history has been built to try to create a story that will benefit those that have taken control of the current simulation in order not to get people to ask questions. It's it's designed to simplify, the when especially when you see something magnificent, well, here's a nice, simple, childlike answer. Oh, okay, I don't want to think about that anymore. As opposed to if you throw out the childish answer and you start thinking, but why would a bunch of cowboys need to build this in Iowa or need to build this in Nebraska? It's just insane. And then again, we start asking, well, how could they do it? One of my favorites, when you look at state capital buildings, particularly ones in the Midwest, what's so fun about them is you'll find like one of the earliest photographs that have been made of it. And there are no roads. Like there are none. It's just like, it's just dirt everywhere and the building. And it's like, well, wait a minute, even if it was built, the first thing I would do as a builder is I'd build a road from wherever I'm taking the materials from to the building site. So the fact that there, there's no road means you, you just didn't build anything because that's, that's step one. You're not going to drag all of your building materials over mud. You just build a road. So that's like, so when you, every time you look into these early photographs, it, you get stuff like that it just tells you obviously whatever the story is not that i know the truth of any of these things but you can dig through the narrative and at least say well it, it, the narrative is false the narrative is obviously a lie and unfortunately that's how it turns out to be everything with history right as, as a i went i was a historian i actually went got my degree in history and um i'm amazed i didn't ask as many questions in you know i asked a lot but i should have asked way more when i was going through my university degree uh, thankfully, I'm glad I didn't continue and like go get a PhD and, and become a scholar because I wouldn't be able to think like this. I'm really thankful that I got what I needed out of my history degree, which was how to research, how to ask questions, how to dig into how to dig into books. But I got out before I got too indoctrinated into this is the only way you're allowed to think. And I was allowed to when I began researching ancient Egypt and things again, I could start clean and fresh and and uh, even though, even though, like my book Power of Then, I'm actually I'm actually considering stopping to sell it, um, because it was written 20 years ago plus or so, and and it just it doesn't reflect how I see reality now anymore. And my concern is that either I'd have to probably what I'd have to do is write a brand new one, um, write a brand new one. This is. Where I, how I used to see ancient Egypt in that time frame, and here's how I see it now. And I think I may have to, when Exit the Cave is done, unfortunately, I've also got um, people have been wanting me to write a book on Southern France and and the story of Rennes Chateau and the Cathars, and because I did that 11-part series yeah. on, the, on the YouTube channel, uh, which is begging for a, a, a more complete exploration. So kind of that one's on the potential 
um, as well. So, but the Egypt, but for when it comes to Egypt, um, you know, I just don't see it the same way I did back then. I, I, I put it too high on a pedestal. And even though I knew it was, I, I, I squeezed in too much into what should have been a much more obvious narrative busting thing of like, not just, you know, the Egyptians didn't build this, any of this stuff. <laughs> they were like, they were like archaeologists digging it out, trying to figure out what the hell they were. Yes. That's the best. For the Pharaonic Egypt, original old kingdom Egypt is not building the stuff. They're trying to understand it and they're trying to copy it as best they can. And then you can immediately tell, here's a pyramid they didn't build. Here's a pyramid that the bottom of it they didn't build and that's all that was left. And then they use their crappy building materials on top of it. And, you know, once you begin to see all of that and you begin to see that all of these tunnels and things that have been built inside of them, like exploration tunnels, they're not built by uh, archaeologists in the 1800s. They were built by the ancient Egyptians 3,000 years ago, trying to figure out what the hell these buildings were. They were the original archaeologists, not the builders. And once I finally got that, it's like, well, this old book kind of, there's some good stuff in there about symbolism and alchemy and, uh, you know, mythology. Okay, but there's too many other things now that are just, I think, are confusing. And so I'm thinking I, I should downgrade it, but I'd like to maybe write the new book before I do. I don't know what to do with it yet. So uh, if I may make a yeah. suggestion, just based on because I'm a creator and my life is out there on a journey with you as well. We have, we're, this is 240 something episodes we're talking on here. I think right. so much differently than I did three years ago or six months ago or for damn sure three weeks ago. But I'm going to leave all those episodes up uh, as a marker of how far I've come okay. and what I've learned and what I've grown. Right. But I don't think that you touching on the fact that you've grown and writing a new book, but leaving the old one out for folks to say, hey, here's where he came from with mm. these understandings is a bad suggestion. If I may put yeah. it out there, sir. Yeah, that's a good idea. One thing I do want to close with here, man, because uh, like I said, I'm going to let you go, but you have an open invite here. I cannot tell you uh, what this conversation meant to me, what your work has meant for me and my ability to balance my life out again, whether it's what's going on or not. You have given me such an anchor of an opposite to uh, anchor myself to. You've given me the other side of Rose's pyramid to say, oh, my God, there's a balanced perspective to be had here. And I can't thank you enough for that, honestly, and the work that you're doing. Also wanted to mention, by the way, that your name Howdy is how die phonetically. So you could also be right. sort of the plant key of how we die here, right? I think it's a little on the nose, but who knows? So yeah. uh, with this, it's though, right. I'd like oh yeah, <laughs> it's right on there. Yeah, it's in there, and, and uh, it's unfortunate that the world is the way it is, and that it's as crazy as it is. Because I have one of the things I've made in the course of this these last three years doing all these interviews is met people like you. Someone that I know that if you and I had time together and we would sit and have coffee and go for a walk and walk our labyrinth together, I mean, we'd have some wonderful experiences. And uh, if the if things change and it gets much easier to just move around the world and not be sort of in, if the world just settles down, then yeah, I'd love to come and visit to Texas and spend some time. And, and I think we'd have a great conversation. I'd be honored. And actually, if you want, stick around here because uh, we have something to talk about then after this. But before I let you run, sir, uh, again, uh, guys, all the ways to find him located down in the show notes. I cannot recommend his books enough. Honestly, I know we talk about a lot. Y'all are like, you read so much. But guys, uh, the writing style, the information, the way it's going to absolutely rock your world in a way that you're going to want. I mean, seriously, if you're if you followed me for this far, if we're. Uh, on this path together of expanding our reality together, which is a verb, by the way, then let's go ahead and do it. You know, bump it up to the next step. If you're sitting here very uh, excited about the new age things that we've been talking about, at least give this another perspective so that you can have a balanced choice. That's all this is, right? So uh, before I let you go, though, sir, if you don't mind, this is some heavy material that we're talking about here. Someone might just want to, like, go off and just jump in a canyon and see if they can successfully make it over the waterfall where you did not what gives you hope? What keeps you moving forward to every step and saying, you know what? Yeah, I could easily end this, possibly not messy for someone else to clean up and just sweet consideration, but what keeps you moving forward, man? Um, the realization that I don't have it, I don't feel I have it completely figured out yet. So it's inner work to finish the job, you might say, to finish the, 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 the trip home. Um, I see it as... Um, I see this place now, like I have, like, it's been a, a party and it's three o'clock in the morning and the party's been fun. It's been okay. There's been some enjoyable things to it, but now it's just a bunch of drunk guys trying to get me to have one more drink and stick around. And I'm just like, guys, I'm, I'm going home. 
you know, I'm, I'm, and, but I, it's like, I need to make sure I know exactly where home is. And so I don't make the wrong turn. So I've got a couple, I've got some more work to do there personally. And so while I'm here, it's just, um, can I be of a little bit of value that maybe, maybe I can be of use to five or 10 people who have started to see reality the same way. And not just people, like I, you know, I talk to animals, I talk to trees, I talk to whatever sometimes. A tree that I really like, I might just remind them, hey, you know, you're you're in a soul trap. And, you know, you might want to examine your reality and think about maybe, you know, when I'm going, maybe hitch a ride, maybe we can get you out too, because I see all of us equally now, everything equally in, in the dream. And so I just try to offer, I guess, a little bit of value to others I think once you get to a certain point, once you've certainly seen through yourself as not being real like you thought you were, not being what you were, having a true awakening of your identity, you kind of have to make up something to stick around. Otherwise, yeah, you'll just, you'll, what's the point? I mean, that's one of the big problems with a true awakening is is uh, people will see through that life is meaningless in that nothing I do really matters. And if you don't, if you can't get it to the next perspective, which is going, there's something beyond the matrix. Yeah, nothing matters from the standpoint of the matrix, the cave, but there's something beyond the cave. If you don't see that, that's where that's where people will get stuck in these things known as right spiritual bypassing or all sorts of names for it, where they, they've seen something true and then they get stuck in that thing and spin themselves and, and just create another trap. So um, you kind of have to give yourself a reason to be here. So my reason was, eventually was, um, in the 30 years I've done all this, I've got some things that could be of value. So I'll just share them and see um, see if that's useful for some other people along the way. And I guess that's, that's why I'm maybe still around. At Sleep Outfitters Outlet, great sleep is a big deal. Save 40 to 60% every day on every Sealy, Stearns & Foster, and Tempur-Pedic. Queens as low as 249 Customer exchanges, closeouts, and floor samples. Inventory changes daily, so come in for your dream deal today. With no credit needed financing, expert advice, and up to 60% off retail, it's never been easier to get the sleep and savings you deserve. Go to sleepoutfittersoutlet.com for financing details and to find a store near you. For the ones who get it done, the most important part is the one you need now. And the best partner is the one who can deliver. That's why millions of maintenance and repair pros trust Granger, Because we have professional-grade supplies for every industry, even hard-to-find products. And we have same-day pickup and next-day delivery on most orders. But most importantly, we have an unwavering commitment to help keep you up and running. Call, click Granger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done.